I would say that in all of my writing, if there was one through line, it is the challenge of inviting people to fall in love with the world again, to fall in love with the world that we have not made, but that is a gift all around us, to see it, to cherish it as a gift, to fall in love with it, and then be activated by that love for its fierce defense. This is Hourglass, the podcast for United Way of King County in Seattle. Coming up, a conversation with Robin Wall Kimmerer, an Indigenous scientist and storyteller whose book Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teaching of Plants, remained on the New York Times bestseller list for more than three years. Kimmerer will be a returning guest speaker for Seattle Arts and Lectures Encore series on December 9th at Town Hall, and United Way of King County is proud to co-sponsor that event. This week's episode will also feature information about United Way's Our Neighbor Fund and an upcoming event at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Discovery Center. I'm your host, Joe Burris. Thanks for tuning in. I had to come to believe in the power of story to invite people in in a way that facts and information alone do not, right? right? Because stories don't tell you what to think. They just tell you to look at something, right. consider this, right. think about this. What if every teacher was like Robin Wall Kimmerer? Imagine learning from an instructor who can make you see all the wonders of the earth beneath you and the sky above you and the vegetation around you. And how all three are not only connected to all that is within you, but they're looking after you, protecting and loving and providing for a human species that doesn't always love back. Kimmerer says in her book Braiding Sweetgrass that of all living things, Humans have the least experience with how to live, and thus the most to learn. Her indigenous teachings, her boundless curiosity, and gift of storytelling passed down from generations as a member of the citizen Potawatomi Nation have put her on a path of learning that many more should follow. Years ago, she penned stories about the relationship between nature, culture, and science in a collection of essays that became her first book, Gathering Moss, A Natural and Cultural History of Mosses. The book was awarded the John Burroughs Medal for Outstanding Nature Writing. Then came Braiding Sweetgrass, which not only became a New York Times bestseller list mainstay, but it was named by the Times as one of the best books of the 21st century. Kimmerer is currently director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment, at the State University of New York's College of Environmental Science and Forestry. In 2015, she addressed the United Nations General Assembly on the topic, Healing Our Relationship with Nature. And in 2022, she was awarded a MacArthur Fellowship, the so-called Genius Award. But Kimmerer's bio scarcely tell the impact her writing has had on people of all ages. Scour the internet, and you'll see videos of young people who say that braiding sweetgrass changed their lives, got them through grief and depression, or spurred them to engage in environmental justice. Kimmerer's teachings are sorely needed by all, but especially by our children, particularly when, according to Yale News, 75% of high school students say they have negative feelings about school. An Education Quizzes reports that only 34% of elementary school students say they like school because they enjoy learning. The Seattle area will be fortunate to learn from Kimmerer in December when she returns to Seattle Arts and Lectures, a nonprofit organization that says it strives to cultivate transformative experiences with readers and writers of all generations. United Way of King County is proudly co-sponsoring the event which is sold out for in-person attendance, but will also be streamed online. The event will be held less than a month after the release of Kimmerer's latest book, The Service Berry, Abundance and Reciprocity in the Natural World. Hourglass recently chatted with Kimmerer, who spoke about everything from her work to her favorite foods to why she enjoys visiting Seattle. I really try to choose what I think of as a high-impact audience, People who will do something with what they learn. Um, and, yeah. and so I had I had that sense 
And besides, I love the Seattle area. Awesome. Pacific Northwest is a, a favorite visit for me. And I have family in Seattle, too. I want to know if you can talk to me about, as a child, what is your most vivid memory of being connected to the land? What a wonderful question. And, you know, I had the great good fortune to grow up in the country where our playground was, you know, the fields and the woods and the creek behind the house. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Um, um, so I was always playing outside. But one of the first times that I, that I remember just feeling mm-hmm. that this was going to be the path for me um, was discovering under a big old white pine with, you know, that soft needled floor underneath it, mm-hmm. I found the patch of little orchids, these plants that I had never seen before. And I can just remember, they were only three or four inches tall, and I just remember lying on my belly looking into these seemingly really exotic plants and thinking like, oh, all I want to do is look at the world. Wow. That, is, that is my advice, is just to look at the world. And um, I kind of haven't stopped since. (laughs) Oh, awesome. I want to read an excerpt from your book that said, it is not just the land that is broken, but more importantly, our relationship to land. In the Western tradition, there is a recognized hierarchy of beings with, with, of course, the human being on top, the pinnacle of evolution, the darling of creation, and the plants at the bottom. But in native ways of knowing, human people are often referred to as the brothers of creation. We say that humans have the least experience with how to live and thus the most to learn. I I want to know if you can just speak to that passage and what made you reach that conclusion, experiences that you've had and what you see in the world how does that relate to the stories of your childhood and in your life that would make you um, write something that's so profound? You know, I think the word that comes to mind for me in your really thoughtful question is a word in our language, which is edpasenduin, and edpasenduin humility. And it's one of the virtues of, of our people. Um, but it doesn't mean humility in the way Western tradition often thinks of it as, you know, being meek and mild, et, et cetera. What Episcendo and this sort of humility means is that I am not more important than anyone else. Mm. Um, what that means, because we are, as human people, we think awfully highly of ourselves. Um, so what that, you know, what that really means is that all of those other beings are just as cool and interesting and deserving as I am. Um, and so that notion of humility, to feel that we are not alone here in the world, you know, all these other species around us with with their own gifts and responsibilities and, and intentions in the world, I love that kind of grounded humility that says, oh, I have got so much to learn here and so many teachers around me. To the second part of your question, where did that come from? You know, certainly it comes from a childhood of awe, of of just, you know, being in love with the world and being surprised every time I went outside. But, you know, I think it also comes from my training as a scientist. Um, Yeah, because, you know, oftentimes people think that science is about answers. But it's and what we know, but really it's about questions and what we don't know. And so in the process of doing science around the living world, um, it reinforces how much we don't know and how sophisticated and interesting the rest of the world is. So, yes, our own species is beautiful and joyful and brilliant, but so are the others. Um, so I think it's that combination of looking at the world um, with humility and um, scientific training that opens your eyes to um, mysteries that exceed our own understanding. It's it's interesting because I think that 
growing up, if I could have had science teachers that taught about science like you, I probably would have enjoyed science a lot more. Um, you know, and if I, if I had math teachers that talked about math, the way you talk about science, I think I probably, and I would probably say that for, for, for kids, period. I mean, it's presented as such an empirical, um, linear statistics driven, a field to where you, you're, you're almost considered someone who needs to be, um, high IQ, high intelligence to, to grasp it and enjoy it almost an insular feel, but you, you give it so much color and so much joy. Um, where does that come from? It, you know, I suspect that it comes from a resistance to exactly the kind of teaching that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I, I remember despairing of having to label the internal organs of an earthworm, you know, like, <laughs> and, and remember, and then, memorizing so many facts uh, that is you know that's not about curiosity that's right. not about wonder it's about rote memorization um so i agree with you completely science should be an invitation to explore the world um and uh and and at the professional level it is but we should teach our children that too you know, during the pandemic, when everybody learned, oh, I guess we're going to have to have school outside. Mm -hmm. I think like, oh, well, let's not go back to school. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah I've, I've, so, hmm. Science should be accessible to everybody. We are all inherently scientists, curious and meaning making. Yeah. I remember doing a story on a marathon runner when I was a sports writer. And I heard someone ask her, when did you start running? And she said, when did you stop? You know, because running is what we do from the time we we learn to 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 stand and put one foot in front of the other, and it's you you learn to do it before you even know what you what you're doing. Um, it it actually takes someone to stop running before before you even realize that you that you 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 stopped. It sounds like it's the same with you. It just comes natural that you would see it that way, and not have to be unlearned to see it as as an empirical field that's a really great analogy that's exactly right but oftentimes the way we address science we, we do have to unlearn that that it's just empirical facts that have no connection to us right. um yeah. yeah yeah i want to touch on the food and i have to say when i read the the council of pecans it brought back my childhood in South Carolina because where I grew up, it's very, very rich in in, um, in pecan uh, trees and the pecan harvesting and selling. But you mentioned, and again, reading an excerpt from your book, um, unlike juicy fruits and berries, which invite you to eat them right away before they spoil, nuts protect themselves with a the hard, almost stony shell and a green, leathery husk. The tree does not mean for you to eat them right away, with the juice dripping down your chin. They're designed to be food for winter, when you need fat, protein, and heavy calories to keep you warm. They are safety for hard times, the, the embryo of survival. Um, I think I read somewhere where you said that you do make pecan pies, but you're not necessarily a fan of, of pecans. Is that true? Well, I I am a big fan of pecans, but pecan pie is too sweet for me. Oh, really? <laughs> um, oh, okay. You know, yeah, I love the nuts, but oftentimes the the rest of it is it, it's not inviting. <laughs> but yeah, mm -hmm. and you know, it, it, I think I say in that chapter that that word pecan um, that and we associate with that really yummy nut. Is a Potawatomi word. Mm -hmm. It comes from pagan, mm -hmm. pagan, the word that just means a nut. Mm -hmm. When you see um, harvesting, and particularly along the lines of, of consumerism, it seems like nature has given us the means of survival if we would just allow it to. Is that something that you see as you look at this country, this world that seems so consumer driven or or do you see it differently well you know the way you phrased that so nicely it makes me think of what i tell my students in my field that's my botany class that 
the the land will give you everything that mm-hmm. you need. Mm. Uh, and so we find medicines and we find carbohydrates, mm-hmm. proteins and fats and perfumes and <laughs> spiritual uplift. All those things are found in the uh, on, on the land. But you know, I think the real key in thinking about how does that translate to the consumer driven world that we live in. The land will give you everything that you need. But we get so confused about what are our needs and our wants. Mm. And, you know, I think in a capitalist society where we have marketers constantly telling us that we don't have enough, that we need more, if we only buy this new thing, well, then we'll be happy. Um, that, that is clearly outstripping the land's ability to sustain us yeah. Yeah. because we're going well beyond enoughness into um, uh, hoarding and overconsumption. And the whole planet is playing, paying the price for that. So I think we need to um, put the brakes. We know this. We have to put the brakes on our consumption. Again, to, to stay with food, talk about some of your favorite foods and why. Mm. Gosh, you know, I'm going to, I was just looking at my jar of manomen of wild rice and realizing it's a little low. So <laughs> I got to send out a, <laughs> a, a message to my wild rice gathering friends. Oh, wow. Um, and love that jar. So okay. wild rice is, the, you know, a wonderful cultural food. Um, that uh, I can't eat every day because it's it's simply not plentiful enough here. Oh, wow. But um, I cherish, but uh, a, a food that I cherish um, because of its origins and because of its uh, cultural resonance. Um, I live in upstate New York, which is apple country. Yes. And so um, all of the gorgeous apples are, are are ripening now. So I'll put them at the top of my of my favorite list too i could go on i mean there's got to be a place for chocolate in there too i used to say that chocolate was uh food groups five through eight but uh <laughs> the, that was before um that was before my, my my body said enough enough processed sugar um <laughs> yeah um what are what are some of your favorite recipes hmm. What are some of my favorite recipes this time of year um, when our gardens are full of tomatoes and peppers and onions to be harvested? I think about my mom's recipe for something that was also my grandma's recipe um, for something called chili sauce. Okay. And it's one of the old time relishes, right, um, that, our, that our grandmas used to make. And... Uh, it's everything from the garden cooked for about 12 hours. So it uh, fills the house with this wonderful, uh, spicy, um, fruity sort of uh, aroma. So that's one that I that I, I really love. This time of year, I'm also pretty crazy for um, sweet corn and zucchini pancakes. Oh, wow. Uh, I got to try those. Oh, my goodness. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Really good. Oh, okay. All right. I read where you said that you come from a family of storytellers. I think particularly you said your your father. Tell My me. father? Yes. Yeah. Um, as you think about the essays to the books, I saw your your TED talk. Where did you take from, including your, your father, to develop your own voice and become the storyteller you are? Hmm. That's such an interesting question. You know, first I think, and I I really enjoy that. Um, I think what I probably learned from my dad's storytelling is that he could take the most mundane little incident and turn it into a story that would be hilarious or. Um, deeply meaningful, mostly mostly hilarious, um, and so he, from him, I sort of learned that starting point with the small, the small, the nearby, the thing that you overlook the significance of, and then um, when you really look at it and it, and see all the ways that it's related to different things, um, it it propels the story. 
Um, so I, I, yeah, I guess that approach of celebrating the ordinary to the point that you see that it's extraordinary is, is um, something that I, I really appreciate about storytelling. Great. When you started writing essays, at what point did you decide to, to put them together to become um, books that you've done? You know, um, the first time that I did that, my first departure from the writing that I was trained in, which is scientific writing, um, was my book Gathering Moss. Mm. And in Seattle, you all know moss very well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, among all the plants, that, that group of little beings are, are among my favorite. And so I wanted to kind of explain in the beginning to my own family of why I was so fascinated by mosses um but the more i did it um i i loved i loved creating stories about them that helped people look and appreciate the world because um yeah um so i began writing them for my family but then soon realized that i wanted to share this with everybody oh wow yeah yeah and you know once i (laughs) once i stepped away from scientific technical writing and into this freer storytelling form when I could really talk about relationships, not in uh, subjectivity, not just objectivity. I loved it so much. It's uh, I just wanted to keep going. Seattle Arts and Lectures Encore series features renowned authors who come back by popular demand. Other Encore series authors include writer and performer Sandra Cisneros, who visits Town Hall on October 8th, and poet and author Maggie Smith, who is slated to visit in February. Seattle's Arts and Lectures says it strives toward a future where story and language revitalize equity, justice, and belonging. Kimmerer's work challenges us to explore our belonging among all that surrounds us with humility, wonder, and love. My last question to you, and it kind of sums up maybe a lot of what I asked you about today. I, I don't know if I read this in your book or I heard it and on a podcast, but you asked the question, what do you love too much to lose and what are you going to do about it? As you think about your work and your conversations and, and the people that you've touched through your work, how does that question speak to what what you do and what is it that you want people to take from it? Yeah. I feel that so much of the environmental movement has been driven and catalyzed by fear. Fear of what is coming toward us. And we are justifiably afraid of what has come is coming toward us that we have created. But I think that the solutions don't lie in fear. We've we've had decades of trying to motivate people in that way, and it has had limited success. But as human beings, I think we know deeply how to love. We know the kind of defense and the fierceness that arises when we name what we love and say, mm, no, I love that too much to lose. This is, I'm, I'm drawing a line in the sand, taking a stand for what I love. Mm. And you know, the, the natural world that I grew up in, I mean, it, it, it's not a stretch to say I was then and am now in love with forests and lands and prairies and, and, and oceans. And I would say that in all of my writing, if there was one through line, it is the challenge of inviting people to fall in love with the world again, to fall in love with the world that we have not made. But that is a gift all around us to see it, to cherish it as a gift, to fall in love with it, and then be activated by that love for its fierce defense. Um, because we know that if what we love, we will we will give everything. So that's that's the invitation. But we can't just say um, fiercely love, fiercely protect it. You have to love it first, and and so. I would say that that is the trajectory of my teaching and writing is to help people fall in love with the world again so we can love it back to wholeness. Thank you so much, Ronald Kimmerus, and 
honor talking to you. Thank you, Joseph. What a delightful conversation. For more information about Seattle Arts and Lectures, log on to lectures.org. Our neighbors are doing their best to keep food on the table, but it's not been easy. During the COVID-19 pandemic, grocery prices rose to their biggest increase in 50 years. Most of the federal dollars that address the food crisis during the pandemic are gone, but grocery bills remain high. That's why United Way of King County has launched the Our Neighbor Fund. We're investing in strategies that will feed families in the coming years. The Our Neighbor Fund will help expand our home grocery program to provide 5,000 families with free groceries each week, and it will help an additional 100 schools in King County implement the Breakfast After the Bell program, impacting 49,000 students. We're asking you to please make a gift to the Our Neighbor Fund so we can serve more of our neighbors. For more information or to make a donation, log on to uwkc.org donate. Join us on October 10th for Creating Connections, Engaging Leaders in Change at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Discovery Center at 5 p.m. As part of United Way's Emerging Leaders 365 speaker series, this event is an opportunity to hear from a panel of young leaders representing careers from civic engagement to global health. The young leaders will reflect on how their experiences shape their education and their career journeys. For more information, log on to uwkc.org events. At United Way of King County, we are working side by side with communities to build an equitable future for everyone. Hourglass United Way is a podcast that highlights how we and our partners spend time making a difference in our communities. Our work is made possible by the generous donations from people like you. Please send comments about and suggestions for our podcast to hourglassunitedway at gmail.com. To learn more about our work or to support United Way, log on to uwkc.org. I'm your host, Joe Burris. Thanks for listening. Until next time.